Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Halloween. This is our series of ghost tours and terrifying tales in London. I know I've always been a fan of the dark side, but we're heading into the witching hour, the month of October, a series of the most ghostly hauntings coming your way. Today, we are going to go 221 feet below London. Today, we're heading into the oldest underground rail network in the world. Established in 1863 with an estimated 1.35 billion people that use the tube annually. I wonder do they know about the stories I'm going to tell you today. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a journey I'm looking forward to taking you on. The terrifying screams of agony of souls that are dearly departed souls that haven't been yet laid to rest that still haunt our London underground. Stay with me. This is a big journey. We're going to be going east, central, City of London, West London. We're taking them all, five of the most haunted tubes in London. Stay tuned, join me on this incredible journey. So on this wet and windy day in London, I'm just bringing you on my little journey that I take most days from my apartment down to the tube. Now the tube in London, as we call it, or the London Underground, was established in 1863. The oldest underground rail network in the world and the first line on the underground was the Metropolitan Line. And that ran from Paddington to Farringdon. And Farringdon will feature today on one of our terrifying stories. Now, the underground network, ladies and gents, is estimated 1.35 billion people annually take journeys on the underground. And it has, over the years, seen its fair share of mass murder, death, and suicide. Not only that, when they were excavating the tube and building the tube, they came across so many graves, cemeteries, they demolished monasteries, they disturbed so many plague pits, ladies and gents, underground during its construction. It's no wonder it's said to be one of the most haunted places in London. And I often think, when people take their daily journeys right down in to the tunnels, 221 feet below, how aware they are of the ghostly sightings and apparitions in the area. Now, most of these sightings come from the underground workers themselves and reports usually in the depths of nights when all those tube stations have closed down and these workers left alone to walk the tracks and the platforms. There's been several sightings of spectres. They've heard the voices of screaming souls. Crying children have been witnessed on the platform. Absolutely no evidence of them, however, on the actual CCTV cameras, as they are monitored 24 hours a day by a central controller. So today we're going to talk a lot about those underground members of staff who have spoken about these terrifying apparitions, some of them resigning from their jobs and refusing to return to the stations. But the first story I'm going to tell you about today involves the biggest, most tragic civilian casualty in this country in World War II. Remarkably, it didn't happen as a result of any bombing or enemy strikes did happen in Bethnal Green tube station in 1943, the result of which 173 people died. Our next stop today is to tell the tale of the tragedy at Bethnal Green station. Now I'm heading in here. This is Collierswood station. Collierswood is going to take me on the northern line to Bank and from there, we're going to change on the central line eastbound to Bethnal Green Station. Now, this is one of the most important signs in London, this Mind the Gap. And a handy tip for you, if you always stand by the P or the M, you're right in front of the door. And I always recommend people go on to the this end the line, of the platform on either side, folks because mostly the tourists tend to congregate in the middle, not knowing. Now we have the whole tube to ourselves right now. That's not gonna last for 
much longer, however. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Bethnal Green Station. This station was opened in 1939. But first, I want you to see these tunnels here, ladies and gentlemen, because this also served another very important purpose during 1940-1941. These were the tunnels that were used as air raid shelters during the Blitz. This station would have housed up to 50,000 Londoners during that horrendous bombing campaign of the Blitz in 1940 and 1941. The chilling sound of air raid sirens would send thousands of Londoners scrambling, making their way deep into the tunnels for safe haven from the bombings of the Luftwaffe that killed over 40,000 civilians. During the Blitz, over 20,000 of them were killed here in London. It is estimated up to 1 million homes were damaged and destroyed, but we're not here to talk about that. We are speaking about the 173 people that were killed in the worst civilian disaster in the Second World War, but ironically, it had nothing to do with a bomb. But before I get into that story, I want to tell you a little bit more about the spectral sightings and the hauntings of this area. One day, a lady was heading down this platform, coming home from work on an evening, and she witnessed a crying child on the corner in her own. She approached the child and asked the child if she was okay, to no response, and when she reached out to touch the child, there was no physical presence. She immediately alerted the tube train drivers and the underground staff. It seemed they were quite aware of this paranormal activity that was taking place in this station. Because, previous to this, several underground workers had told their own variations of this story. One particular worker would come down here after the train station had been closed. A very different time to what it looks like now during rush hour. It would have been a very quiet and somber place. Later on, he would tell his colleagues he heard a child in absolute hysterics and tears, which then magnified into a group of screaming children until eventually he was listening to the hysterical screams and cries of what sounded like multiple groups of women. It became so loud, it terrified the living daylights out of him and he ran to his office manager and line controller and they checked the CCTV images but it was to no avail. There was nobody present in the station. But what were these terrifying cries? Regretfully, I'm going to take you back to one of the darkest nights in London's history of the underground. This story takes us back to war-torn Britain. Ladies and gentlemen, the 3rd of March of 1943. The Blitz had ended just over a year before and the Allied forces were bombing Berlin. People had become accustomed to the air raid sirens and they also had a sense of unease because they knew that there would be some form of retribution for this bombing campaign that was taking place in Berlin. So people were on edge. They knew that any minute Adolf Hitler could exact his revenge. That night at 8.13 p.m., the chilling sound of the air raid warning sounded. Hundreds of people immediately made their way to Bethnal Green Station. They made their way to these steps and to this very narrow passage. Now, during the Blitz, all the lights were blackened out. And regretfully, even though that day had been quite mild, it had been raining during the day, so these steps were quite slippy. But hundreds arrived here and made their way here, abandoning their dinners, some heading straight for the shelter of the tube station. At 8.27, three packed double-decker buses arrived at this bus station, packed with people coming from nightclubs, pubs and bars, all making their way in the pitch dark down, at the time, these very, very narrow steps. Everyone headed in the same direction, in the pitch dark, towards the narrow stairs leading to the underground. At exactly the same time that evening, a new anti-aircraft rocket fired nearby and this unfamiliar sound 
to the crowd caused mass panic. People had assumed it was a German bomb. Immediately a crush ensued and one lady at the bottom of the stairs slipped on the wet stairs carrying a baby. Another man then fell on top of her and while others began to pile and trip on top of them, creating this mass domino effect combined with the pitch dark, the panic and the urgency of the crowd, chaos further ensued as people kept coming through the narrow entrance, unaware of what was happening at the bottom. Of all the stories I'm going to tell today, it's hard not to be completely overwhelmed by this extreme panic, mass hysteria that must have been felt. It's no wonder that some of them cannot lay to rest for eternity. This memorial commemorates the worst civilian disaster of World War II. It happened on the stairs below where 173 people died in a crush of people trying to get the tube and air raid shelter. A terrible tragedy that is still etched in the memories of Londoners to this day. The spirits that haunt the station, a permanent reminder of that fateful night in 1943. Now, our next story today on our haunted underground stations centers around Bank Station. Now, Bank Station is situated here in the heart of the city of London. And right behind me here is the magnificent building known as the Old Lady of Threadneedle Street. This is the Bank of England, the advisory bank to the government of Great Britain. But the reason we're here today, we're going back to 1811 and the haunting tale of the Black Nun of Bank. Before we delve into the mysterious world of the Black Nun of Bank, I want to introduce you to my best friend and colleague who runs ghost tours in the area. And this is the wonderful Rob. He is going to tell us a little bit more about the dark history in this area. Yes, well, thanks for joining me, Sinead, because behind me is the church of St. Mary Walnuff. Now, this church was built by a man called Nicholas Hawksmoor around about the early 18th century, 1727 it was completed. And it stood here proudly as a church for well over 100 years. But in the late 1800s, the London Underground was being constructed, particularly the City and South London Railway, which we now know as the Northern Line. Now, they wanted the Northern Line to terminate right here on King William Street, but they had nowhere to put the tracks and the tunnels. They were going to knock the church down, but the people in the local area, they were outraged. They were like, you can't destroy our church. They came to a compromise. They would reinforce the church. they keep it standing as long as the church would give up its crypt. And the crypt became used as part of the tunnels of the Northern Line. So the Northern Line goes through the old crypt of St. So Mary I'm passing Warner through church. the crypt of these You're tunnels. You're passing right through the crypt. When I take my tunnel. Northern Line home. Just around the other side of the church is now a Starbucks. And that Starbucks was the entrance to King William Street Station. So if you're ever on the Northern Line approaching Bank, then uh, look over your shoulder. There might be a, a ghost or a skeleton looking over your shoulder trying to read your copy Ghostly of the Ghostly activity. Spooky, right? And that brings us on to the location of a cemetery that was also in the area. Yes, well, the and cemetery of the church, of St. Mary Warnoff Church, was actually right in front of the church itself. And as well as giving up its crypt, it also gave up its cemetery. Now, the cemetery would have been right here where the entrance to the bank station is now. So just imagine all those bodies they would have dug up and moved elsewhere in order to put the staircase in place for the entrance to Bank Underground Station. Disturbing it's, those souls. Disturbing those have. souls some form of effect or paranormal activity in the area. People who walk down this staircase do occasionally report touches and pushes. Being pushed down being the stairs. Being pushed down the stairs, the sensation of being watched, followed. Ooh. You know, it's a very, it's a very pleasing area, of course. <laughs> but we're going to go back all the way to 1811. Yes. And the story Rob is going to tell us a little bit more about is that Sarah Whitehead, the Black Nun, of Bank. 
Yes, well, Sarah Whitehead, the black nun or the bank nun, or she's sometimes also known as the old lady of Threadneedle Street, which is also the nickname of the bank That's itself. The bank. Um, she was a woman of the early 19th century. Um, her and her brother Philip were very, very close, very, very close siblings. Now, Philip worked as a bank teller, as a clerk in the Bank of England. Now, unbeknownst to Sarah, Philip had got himself into a little bit of a little bit of a debt, a little bit of a gambling debt. So, whilst at work as the bank clerk, obviously he's got access to all this lovely money. So he took some of the money, defrauded the bank. Now he was arrested, he was tried for fraud, and later executed. Now Sarah was very close to her brother Phil, and she's quite a sensitive soul, so her family and friends, they kept the whole thing secret from Sarah. They didn't tell her about the arrest of her brother. They didn't tell her about the trial. They certainly didn't tell her about the uh, Ooh, so verdict. Technically, she was in the dark. She was completely in the dark. So Philip was executed in the early months of 1812. Now, Sarah only found out about her brother's death when one day she skipped merrily down to the bank trying to meet her brother from work, maybe go for a nice drink, a bit of dinner. As she approached, she started asking people, has anyone seen my brother? And it was only then that the bank staff said to her, oh, oh, you haven't heard. I'm afraid your brother has been hanged. Now, understandably, this made Sarah go out of her mind in grief. She went home that night, absolutely lost her mind. The next day, she'd forgotten everything she'd been told the previous day. She goes down to the bank the next day. She asks people again, have you seen my brother? Again, she's told the same thing. Again, she gets hysterical. This goes on every single day. For 25, for 25 years, years, I believe, years. she now, called here she, looking for her brother. The reason she's known as the bank nun is because she wears a very distinctive long black dress and a black veil over her face in memory of her brother, but she still refuses to believe her brother's dead, so she carries on going every single day. Now, eventually, the bank starts to offer her money. They say to her, if we give you some money, will you please go away? You're getting quite annoying by now, coming here every single day. God bless her. So she takes a bribe. She takes a big sack of money under the promise that she'll never come back to the bank again. And she keeps this promise for the rest of her life. Well, then, of she course, was living. she dies. And the promise she kept in her life, oh, she doesn't need to keep it in the afterlife, does she? And now people say, when they're at the Bank of England, particularly this staircase we're approaching now, they'll be approached by a woman in a long black dress with a veil over her face, asking, excuse me, have you seen my brother? Brother, right on these steps, folks. And in the bank station, here, in the middle of central London. Can't help but feel for her in her devastating grief, still questioning the location of her brother. And that is Bank Station, ladies and gentlemen. So I just want to show you where I am right now. I'm right in the heart of Theodore Land, essentially, and part of London's West End. So if you look straight ahead there, I'm in the centre of the road. Just at the very end, you will notice Nelson's Collier, which is located in Trafalgar Square. And if I spin you around, you will see with the street, known as the Strand, is full of theatre shows and Broadway shows a lot here. Already I can see Pretty Woman 6. And the theatre we're concerned with is the Adelphi Theatre here, showing Back to the Future. Now, our story takes us back, and I want to talk all about a chap called William Charles James Lewin, known as William Terrace. He was brutally murdered by an actor called Richard Archer Price in 1897. Now, the, it was the murder of the day and it caused a massive stir in the press due to the popularity of Terrace as an actor. He regularly played the lead in productions such as Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, uh, also in Rebecca, and he was also a wonderfully trained Shakespearean actor. He was a very colorful character who had traveled extensively, but his life was cut short, tragically, at the age of 49, at the hands of this fellow actor. Richard Price was himself an actor, but he had struggled to find work. He had a very serious drink problem, and he had suffered mental health issues, but that didn't stop William Terrace attempting to help him. He occasionally helped him find some work, but they were both working together in a production and signed in this very theatre. And reputedly, Archer said something 
it was a rumor he had said something untoward about Terrace, and he had him fired. However, that didn't stop Terrace from continuing to directly support Prince by sending small sums of money to the Actors Benevolent Fund for him, and he continued to find him work. But by the end of 1897, Prince was destitute, technically unemployable. But that seed had been sown. He always blamed him for having him fired from this production. So that night, the night before his brutal murder, both men were seen arguing in the dressing room, in Terrace's dressing room, inside in the theater. So the following night would seal his fate. And we're gonna have a bit bullet in court here. So I can finish the story for you. So we're gonna head up here, look how pretty it is. And here you have also, speaking of famous actors and actresses, this is the Nell Gwynn pub. Another famous orange seller and actress. She was a reputed mistress of King Charles II. The Merry Monarch is quite lively around here. But alas, Prince concealed himself right here on Maiden Lane and he waited for Terrace to arrive. Now Terrace had been working, he was the star of this show that was with, alongside his leading lady, who was reputedly his girlfriend at the time. And her name was Jessie Melward. And he arrives up here, heading into the back door, whereas Prince had concealed himself in this alleyway waiting for Terrace to arrive and he headed up here and he brutally stabbed him to death in front of many many witnesses right outside the stage door up here now people scrambled to save his life and reputedly he died in the arms of his girlfriend actress and his re reputed lover Jessie Millward and as he lay dying in her arms he said I will be coming back and that is the plaque dedicated to the hero of the Adelphi melodrama met the untimely end outside this theater 16th of December 1897 now, this was a massive media frenzy at the time, of course. He was immediately convicted and tried, but he was convicted as being criminally insane. And he was sent to the famous Broadmoor Asylum for Lunatics, as they called it at the time, where he lived out his days and died in there. But for years, the Adelphi have reported that there's been a lot of mysterious ghost activity inside the theater, centering around William Terrace. Now, when William Tellerus used to arrive to the theatre, he'd always notify his girlfriend, his leading lady, that he was there by knocking or tapping lightly on her dressing room door when he arrived, just to inform her he had arrived in the theatre. Years later, one actress recorded hearing tapping noises on her door. Over the years as well, there's been appearances of strange glowing lights and orbs which are frequently seen. Another report was of a tourist, just a random tourist, arrived here in London, completely unaware of any of the story of, to do with William Terrace or the murder of the actor. And as she was in this alleyway, she reported seeing a man coming towards her dressed in old-fashioned clothes, uh, very distinguishedly dressed and well-dressed, but he appeared to drift rather than walk and he had a soulless kind of stony look in his eyes as if he stared right through her and he made his way back up here and when he did she followed him and literally saw him disappear right where the site of his murder was at the stage door uh, now, over the years, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of strange sightings. One particular, um, I think it was described as a green mist came up from the stage 
the audience had witnessed this and it kind of formed into this human-like figure that drifted over their heads. So William Terrace's ghost not only haunts the Adelphi Theatre, but is also said to haunt what was his favorite bakery in Covent Garden. And that bakery was demolished and on the site of that bakery was the tube station built Covent Garden. Now there's been several sightings of William Terrace in there and we know it's William Terrace because most of the people who have witnessed this man have been shown a photograph of him and they've said that's the exact same person that they have engaged with or spoke with on the underground. So not only is that commuters who have noticed the spectral activity. So let's head in to one of the busiest stations in the West End, ladies and gents. I want to take you in to the haunted Covent Garden station. And I often wonder if these people, when they're heading so far underground, realize that, that tall, elegant man of six foot three by the name of William Terrace is watching them from every corner. So the first story I want to tell you with regards to the haunting of William Terrace is a ticket collector by the name of Jack Hayden who's making a final check of all the deserted platforms here in Covent Garden noticed a tall and distinguished looking man on the westbound platform. After Hayden saw the man leaving the platform, he saw him heading towards the emergency staircase. So this is the emergency staircase and it has 193 steps. And we're going to take that down. But he immediately himself, so after he saw him heading for this staircase, he quickly telephoned upstairs and told the booking office clerk to apprehend the man. Hayden took the elevator himself up and met the puzzle clerk who said no man had emerged from these very stairs. So William Terrace reportedly, after being spotted on the underground, had taken these 193 steps up just mysteriously disappeared. Now several reports of William Terrace have also been made by commuters who have said they have come across very distinguished, tall, 109, um, six foot three, well-dressed, elegant man coming up these stairs. So have you ever encountered any spectral sightings, ladies and gents? Will we run into William Terrace today? What's well, taking our journey down these very steps to the platform of Covent Garden? Our next journey is going to take us to very spooky paranormal activity on the Bakerloo Line, ladies and gents. That's coming up in part two of our haunted London underground stations. Stay tuned.